Hello, welcome to the channel. Um, a little while ago I did a video on the strip down of a destroyed 2.7 Jaguar diesel engine, TD V6. Um, that also basically applies to the 3 litre, the 2.2, and it probably goes right across the Jaguar range and possibly across the Land Rover range as well. I'm not too sure about Land Rover, don't do that many, so I haven't really researched it. But I've researched this and I can now give you the reason those engines destroy themselves. Alright, I'm going to read this to you. This is all Jaguar literature. Um, so you can take it basically as gospel, it's, it's their research and everything is what they've done. It's worth listening to this, it, it's not that long, uh, the video isn't that long, so it's fairly um, easy to take in, you know, make yourself a cup of tea, have a coffee or tea and just listen to it. And uh, But I, I think it is of, of interest to everybody, especially if you own a 2.73 litre, 2.2 or Jaguar diesel across the range, Land Rover. Um, it will give you the reason for these engines falling to pieces. It isn't every engine and it's only a very small number. I know people say, no, it's not, it's thousands of them. It's not. You see a lot of them on the internet. They're just all bunched together on there. Any, anybody with a problem is going to go on the internet. If they don't have a problem, they're not going to go on the internet. So you see quite a few on the internet, but it's a very small percentage of the amount of engines that have been produced and are still driving around in Jags and Range Rovers today without a problem. Anyway, I'll start, start with the literature. The, this is on the diesel particulate filter and it's a system operation. Now stick with it because you'll gradually hear quite a few words repeated throughout it. It's not that long. You've got the regeneration system, which is two different phases. The first is passive regeneration, and the second is active regeneration. Now the passive regeneration, I'll quickly go through it and explain it to you afterwards. Passive regeneration requires no special engine management intervention and occurs during normal engine operation. The passive regeneration involves a slow conversion of the particulate matter deposited in the DPF into carbon dioxide. This process is active when the DPF temperature reaches 250 degrees centigrade, 482 degrees Fahrenheit and is a continuous process when the vehicle is being driven at higher engine loads and speeds. During passive regeneration, only a portion of the particulate matter is converted into carbon dioxide. This is due to the chemical reaction process which is only effective within the normal operating temperature range of 250 degrees to 500 degrees centigrade, 482 to 932 degrees Fahrenheit. Above this temperature range, the conversion efficiency of the particulates into carbon dioxide, dioxide increases as the DPF temperature is raised. These temperatures can only be achieved using the active regeneration process. So basically, you keep that in mind. You've got that phase, passive regeneration, but it doesn't alter any of the any engine management system. It's, it's literally happening. You don't know it's happening. It's not altering anything, it's not causing any problems, it won't cause any problems as long as it's working correctly. So you can keep that in mind. It's something just to keep in mind. Now you have the active regeneration. Active regeneration starts when the particular loading of the DPF reaches a threshold as monitored or determined by the DPF control software. The threshold calculation is based on driving style. Remember that driving style, that comes up a lot. Distance travelled and back pressure signals from the differential pressure sensor. Active regeneration generally occurs every 450 miles at 725 kilometres. 
Although this is highly dependent on how the vehicle is driven, driving style again. For example, if the vehicle is driven at low loads in urban traffic regularly, active regeneration will, incur, will occur more often. This is due to the rapid build-up of particulates in the DPF and if the vehicle is driven at higher speeds when passive regeneration will occur or will have occurred. The DPF software incorporates a mileage trigger which is used as backup for active regeneration. If active regeneration has not been initiated by a back pressure signal from the differential pressure sensor, regeneration is requested based on distance travelled. Active regeneration of the DPF is commenced when the temperature of the DPF is increased to the combustion temperature of the particles. The DPF temperature is raised by increasing the exhaust gas temperature. This is achieved by introducing post-injection of fuel after the pilot and main fuel injections have occurred. That's very important to remember. This is determined by the DPF software monitoring the signals from the two DPF temperature sensors to establish the temperature of the DPF. Depending on the DPF temperature, the DPF software requires the ECM to perform either one or two post injections of fuel. So that means you're getting four injections of fuel. That's important, remember. The first post injection of fuel retards combustion inside the cylinder which increases the temperature of the exhaust gas. The second post injection of fuel is injected late in the power stroke cycle. The fuel partly combusts in the cylinder but some unburnt fuel also passes into the exhaust where it creates an exothermic event within the catalytic converter further increasing the temperature of the DPF. The active regeneration process takes approximately 20 minutes to complete. The first phase increases the DPF temperature to 500 degrees centigrade, 932 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's hot. The second phase further increases the DPF temperature to 600 degrees centigrade, 1112 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the optimum temperature for particle combustion. This temperature is then maintained for 15 to 20 minutes to ensure complete incineration of the particles within the DPF. The incineration process converts the carbon particles to carbon dioxide and water. The active regeneration temperature of the DPF is closely monitored by the DPF software to maintain a target temperature of 600 degrees centigrade, 1112 degrees Fahrenheit at the DPF inlet. The temperature control ensures that the temperatures do not exceed the optional operational limits of the turbocharger and the catalytic converter. The turbocharger inlet temperature must not exceed 830 degrees centigrade, 1526 degrees Fahrenheit, and the cat catalytic converter brick temperature must not exceed 800 degrees centigrade, 1472 degrees Fahrenheit and the exit temperature must remain below 750 degrees centigrade, 1038 degrees Fahrenheit. That is all controlled by the computer, onboard computer, so it's, it's, it's not the sort of thing you have to worry about as long as it's working okay. During the active regeneration process, the following ECM controlled events occur. The turbocharger is maintained in the fully open position, this minimises heat transmission from the exhaust gas to the turbocharger and reduces the rate of exhaust gas flow allowing optimum heating of the DPF. If the driver demands an increase in engine torque, the turbocharger will respond by closing the vanes as necessary. The throttle is closed as this assists in increasing the exhaust gas temperature and reduces the rate of exhaust gas flow which has the effect of reducing the time for the DPF to read the optimum temperature. The exhaust gas reduction EGR valve is closed. The use of EGR decreases the exhaust gas temperature and therefore prevents the optimum DPF temperature being achieved. Due to, if due to the vehicle usage 
and or driving style, again that driving style, the active regeneration process cannot take place or is unable to regenerate the DPF. The dealer can force regenerate the DPF. This is achieved by either driving the vehicle until the engine is at its normal operating temperature and then driving for a further 20 minutes at speeds of not less than 30 miles per hour, 48 kilometers an hour, or by connecting a Jaguar approved diagnostic system to the vehicle which will guide the technician through an automated regeneration procedure to clean the DPF. Diesel particulate filter control, that's, um, that's, that's just more software on there. DPF management control, uh, DPF management module. The DPF, manage, DPF fuel management module controls the following functions. Timing and quantity of the four split injections per stroke, pilot, main and two post injections. Four injections of fuel going into that engine. Injection pressure and the transition between the three different calibrate, calibration levels of injection. The above functions are dependent on the condition of the catalytic converter and the DPF. So it's altering all the time basically. The fuel management Cal calculates the quantity and timing for the four split injections for each of the three calibration levels for injection pressure and al also manages the transition between the levels. The two post injections are required to separate the functionality of increasing in cylinder gas temperatures and the production of hydrocarbons. The first post injection is used to generate the higher in cylinder gas temperature while sim simultaneously retaining the same engine torque output produced during normal non-regeneration engine operation. The second post injection is used to generate hydrocarbons by allowing unburnt fuel into the catalytic converter without producing increased engine torque. Right, the rest of it is, um, I'll just skip these because it's DPF air management module, um, front section of the catalytic converters, rear section, catalytic converters, and we'll go on to the uh, picture now, which I'll just show you. This is your exhaust system on the Jaguar. They, they do vary. On the three litre, it's slightly different. You, you can have one catalytic converter, um, but it's the same system, basically. It does the same things. So these are your catalytic converters here, here, and that's your DPF there. The rest are silencer boxes. So catalytic converters here and the DPF, the re regeneration DPF is there. Okay. Right, now we go on to I'll go on to this next part. I've missed out a few bits here because it, it's um, it's really technical and um, to me, it's not that interesting. <laughs> There's not a lot you can do about it. You can't change it. It's going to be there. But we'll go on to the rest of it. The exhaust gas and DPF temperatures are controlled by the DPF software located in the ECM. The DPF software monitors the load status of the DPF based on driving style. Again, driving style. Distance travelled and signals from the differential pressure sensor and temperature sensors. When the particular loading of the DPF reaches predetermined levels, the DPF is actively, actively regenerated by adjusting in conjunction with the ECM various engine control functions such as fuel injection, intake air throttle, exhaust gas recirculation, turbocharger boost pressure control. The regeneration process is possibly because it's possible because of the flexibility of the common rail fuel injection engine which provides precise control of fuel flow, fuel pressure and injection timing which are essential requirements to promote the efficient regeneration process. Two processes are used to regenerate the DPF, passive and effective. I think you probably guessed by now that the reason for those engines self-destructing I think you've probably guessed it, but we'll go on. Instrument cluster indications. For drivers who make regular short journeys at low speeds, it may not be possible to efficiently regenerate the DPF. 
In this case, the DPF software will detect a blockage of the DPF from signals from the differential pressure sensor and will alert, will alert the driver as follows. When the DPF becomes full, the driver will be alerted to this condition by a message, DPF full, accompanied by a handbook symbol. As detailed in the owner's handbook, the driver should drive the vehicle until the engine is, is at its normal operating temperature and then drive for a further 20 minutes at, at speeds of not less than 30 mph, 48 km an hour. Successful regeneration of the DPF is indicated to the driver by the DPF full message no longer being displayed. If the DPF software detects that the DPF is still blocked, the message will change to DPF full visit dealer. The driver should take the vehicle to an authorised dealer to have the DPF force regenerated. Okay, now we get to the, um, the main part. Diesel particulate filter side effects. Okay. <laughs> The following section details some side effects caused by the active regeneration process. Engine oil dilution. Engine oil dilution can occur due to small amounts of fuel entering the engine crankcase during post injection phases. So these are the two injection phases after the engine's fired. This has made it necessary to introduce a calculation based on driving style. That's that driving style again. To reduce oil service intervals if necessary. The driver is alerted to the oil service by a message in the instrument cluster. The DPF software monitors the driving style, the frequency of the active regeneration and duration. Using this information, a calculation can be made on the engine oil dilution. When the DPS software calculates the engine oil dilution has reached a predetermined threshold, fuel being 7% of engine oil volume, a service message is displayed in the instrument cluster. Depending on driving style, some vehicles may require an oil service before the designated interval. In a service message, if a service message is displayed, a vehicle will be required to have a full service and the service interval counter will be reset. During the active regeneration process of the DPF, there will be an increase in fuel consumption. However, because active regeneration occurs infrequently and for limited periods of time, the overall effect on fuel consumption is approximately 2%. The additional fuel used during the active regeneration process is accounted for in the instantaneous and average fuel consumption displays in the instrument cluster. Okay, that's what Jaguar was saying. And we've got to say that as a fact. They have all the testing equipment. They've known this for years. Um, I was suspicious of it. I couldn't say for certain. I don't like to say, look, this is definitely what's happening. This is why this engine's fallen apart, unless I know for certain, or 99% sure. Um, people that say, oh, well, it's this, or it's a design fault, or a manufacturing fault, um, etc., or you're using the wrong grade of oil, etc. It's really pointless to listen to all that, because you could end up just getting deeper and deeper. If someone recommends using a different grade oil, um, if you've got a warranty on the vehicle, whether it's Jaguar or aftermarket warranty, they'll have service intervals. And if you ask them to put a different grade of oil in, then you are likely to uh, lose your warranty. Uh, you know, when you come to claim, they're, they're going to say, well, no, you've used the wrong oil. And, and they're perfectly entitled to do that. Also, if you think, well, you know, I've had other people suggest take the DPF off, you know, chuck it in the bin and have the um, computer uh, adjusted. Well, you can, but that's illegal, I, I think. I mean, I'm not sure it's 100% illegal. I haven't looked it up, but it certainly wouldn't pass an MOT if you did that. And um, also, I would think your insurance could become null and void because they put down... 
usually when you fill out an insurance certificate, it will say, is the car modified at all? And if you say no, and you take the DPF off, then they've got the perfect reason just, just to say no, they're not paying out. So whether it would go that far or whatever, I don't know. But you have to take all these other things into account before you start taking things off a car and chucking it, you know, chucking it away. I was suspicious of this. I was quite suspicious of it for, for um, the main reason is that the early S-types that I've had quite a few work, well, I've, I've had quite a few in for servicing, don't suffer with this problem. They're very reliable. They seem to be on the road. They've done, I've seen them doing 400,000 miles and haven't had a problem. I've serviced them, no problem at all. And, but in 2006, so you've got the 2004, 2005 S types, those engines are great, no, no problem at all. Probably the same on the XJ6, if, if, you know, with the diesel engines. As soon as it's late 2006, 2007 they fitted this regeneration system on the s-types so you get a lot of those s-types self-destructing the engines just going out um, of course all the xj's all, 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 all the xf's FFs, and probably the xj6s etc and, and everything anything else was had this system fitted so you're going to have that problem this also applies to the 2.2 diesel and I would imagine across the Jaguar and Land Rover range I can't say that but I'm, I'm guessing on the Land Rover range because they suffer with the same sort of problems they get they get broken cranks which people say well it's a, a weak crank well it may be a weak crank to what it could be but um, I doubt very much whether the crank just snaps I would imagine first that the it, it loses this pressure on the oil the actual oil dilutes and you end up with the crank bouncing about in the main journals and uh, breaking for that reason. Um, any, anything can be improved on, of course, any engine. You could improve on it, you could put forge cranks and pistons and God knows what else in. But obviously they don't make it that way, it's made for a purpose and it's, um, as I said pre previously, there's a much higher percentage of these vehicles driving around without a problem and the only thing I can say so you can't really do a lot about this apart from what I've always advised and I've done for many years now any cars coming in for a service is I tell them 5,000 mile oil and filter change engine oil and filter change without exception all right if, if they're out and about and it stretches up to 6,000 mile but not over 6,000 mile definitely 5,000 mile if that can be achieved if you do it sooner than that then all the better I don't know when this I mean I wouldn't like 7% of diesel fuel in my engine oil <laughs> any time and it doesn't just dump 7% in there it's built up over a period of time it starts off you know one two three and builds up to 7% I wouldn't like any diesel fuel in my engine it's simple as that um, the oil that Jaguar recommend I stick to uh, a lot of people say use a higher grade I stick to the oil they recommend for the simple reason that they've spent a lot of money or the oil company has spent a lot of money um, working with Jaguar to uh, produce this oil and you know these mechanics or workshop people are saying oh well you know use this oil i mean if, if they know better than jaguar and the oil company's fine you know go for it if you want to believe that i personally would stick to the original oil that's recommended and i would give it each car a 5,000 mile service and oil filter you know engine oil and oil filter change don't have to worry about any other service just the engine and oil filter change it is built in, obviously, Jaguar have known about this for years. Anyone that buys one of these cars should be forewarned about this. They should be given notification of what can happen. It, it wouldn't exactly tempt someone to buy a car this happens to. Obviously, if I was told, well, if, you know, you've got to drive it in a certain way, I think, well, 
I don't know, did I try with it like that for the past month or two months? I don't know. You don't think about it, you just get in and drive. You expect to drive it and not have any problems. You expect to service it and the car will go on for many, many years and thousands upon, you know, hundreds of thousands of miles without a problem. So it's probably not a good selling point, but they should, you know, you should have informed consent. If you're going to buy something, spend a lot of money on a vehicle, you should know what can happen. You know, these are side effects. You know, they're not something that crops up. Oh, we didn't know about that. This is a known side effect, oil dilution, and is probably the main cause for all these engines self-destroying themselves, self-destructing. Obviously, other things can cause that. You can, you know, overheat diesel. It's not good to overheat a diesel. You can run it low on oil. Um, it, you know, you can just go crazy with the car um, and, and cause damage to the engine. Of course you can. Um, you know, most engines you should really start up, leave on tick over for a little while, just so the oil gets around and gets a bit of temperature there. Um, same with the turbos, you know, you don't want to be revving up when you get home with a turbo, revving it up and switching it off because that turbo turns, at, you know, high revs per minute and that will still be turning with no oil pressure behind it. So, you know, you don't do things like that, but obviously you can have problems for other reasons, but that's the same across the board, any engine, any, any car, you, you can get that. This is mainly, as far as I know, Jaguar Land Rover, whether it's They've got these sort of systems fitted to other vehicles, other makes and models, I don't know. I don't really get involved in all that, so you know, you'd have to research all that. But anyway, I, I hope this video has been informative and I hope now you realise um, the main cause of these engines self-destructing. And if you follow a 5,000 mile service, I'm not saying that's exact, I don't know. I don't know how much the engine oil has been diluted up to 5,000 miles. I would think it's safe, and it seems to have been safe in my experience. I haven't had a problem. All the cars I've serviced, we've had no problems with the engines whatsoever. Across the board, I've, I've always done it, 2.2s, 2 litres, anything. I, I do the whole lot, 5,000 mile services. Um, and I don't seem to have had a problem, but that's my opinion, my experience. You've got to do as you want to do. Um, some people do it at 3,000 mile. I mean, it, it, it can't hurt, but obviously how many times do you want to keep changing your oil? And have you got the time to keep, you know, whipping it into a garage or doing it yourself? I don't know. But that's entirely up to you. But I recommend 5,000 mile. You must do whatever you feel safe doing. But on the upside, there's nothing wrong with the actual engines. <laughs> they are very well designed engines and they work very well. You don't have the problem. It's just the DPF, the system, the regeneration system that is fitted. That is the problem. It's not the engine that's the problem. It's not the design of the engine. It's not the manufacturing of the engine. It's not the oil used. It's literally the regeneration system that's been fitted and the way the computer alters the injection system on the engine and everything else on the engine. That is the problem. So I hope um, you're happy with the video. And if, if you are, please like and subscribe. It just helps me to get, I have to delve into all this paperwork. It takes forever. Um, but like and subscribe. And uh, then it'll give me more enthusiasm to make more videos. And I hope this has been helpful to you. And thanks for watching.